So, exercise number five. This week we are going to talk about an important operation in signal processing and image processing, which is convolution. And the two exercises, 5.2 and 5.3, that we are going to look at today are precisely about this operation. So let me jump to the first exercise. Um, so, exercise 5.2 um, starts where basically where we left off last week. So last week we, we discussed uh, this vector space L1 of Z. And now, um, so we talked about the norm and how the elements of this vector space look like. And today we are going to look at an important operation on this vector space, which is the convolution. And as you saw in the lecture, the convolution is defined as follows. So first of all, I want you to note that the outcome of a convolution is again a sequence. This means that the object that we get once we convolute a vector x who comes from L1, with a vector y, who also comes from L1, we get a sequence again. And the sequence is defined for, of course, each index n via this formula here. So it is a sum of x's and y's. And if you um, have trouble memorizing this formula, think about it uh, as that. So you want to have your outcome at position n, yeah, the nth entry of our outcome sequence. And if you take a close look at the indices that we have here, um, we have x at position k times y at position n minus k. And so I always memorize it like this, that the sum of k and n minus k is n again. So if we sum up these two indices, I need to get out the one that is also on the left hand side here. And of course, you can also change the roles of n minus k and, uh, and k, and you get an equivalent formula for the convolution. All right. So convolution of two sequences is again a sequence. And we want to to do a little example here, so also two sequences that we know from last week are uh, EL and Psi Q. And we want to calculate, um, we want to calculate the convolution of those two. Yeah, I have plugged in a value of L and a value of Q, but we want to do it a little bit more uh, general here um, because um, yeah, in the end, we just need to plug in the numbers to get the result. Here, so so what we do in 5.2a, so we take uh, an L index uh, in Z, we take a complex number Q that has absolute value smaller than one, and remember, if we calculate the convolution of EL with psi Q, we get a sequence again. So if you want to calculate the convolution, this means that we want to know the value of our sequence at each index n. Yeah, for each um, n in Z. So first step, we want to calculate this thing. So we use the formula that we are given or that we also know from the lecture. So I'm just going to copy down what we have here on the left side, but changing x and y by the respective sequences that we have in this example. So we take the sum over all k in z, and then the first sequence, which is el at position k times, so the second sequence y is psi q in our case, psi q of and then n minus k such that the sum of k and n minus k is n again. So far for the definition and now we can use how our sequences el and psi q are built up. So first 
let us focus on this on the simpler sequence of both, which is EL. So EL is a sequence that is one only if K equals L and zero else. Meaning that if we take a look at this sum here, which is an infinite sum, we see that K runs through all the integers. So it will eventually be also equal to L at some position. And for all the other cases, EL will be zero. So what remains here is just EL at position L times, okay, now I plugged in the value L for K, Psi Q of N minus L. Yeah, all other summons are zero. Because AL of K equals zero if K is not equal to L here. So, but EL, so let me fix my handwriting. So EL of L is one. So the result is Psi Q of N minus L. So this is now our new sequence. And let us maybe understand what this operation that looks so simple did with our original sequence. So if we have our indices n, and let's say we take indices 0, 1, 2, 3, and also to the left, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, then our sequence psi q of n will be the following. So in here, of course, we will have Psi Q of zero. Here we will have Psi Q of one, Psi Q of two, Psi Q of minus one. So this is not, nothing um, special here. And now we take a look at the new sequence that we have here. So now let's say um, we set L equal to one. Then Psi Q of n minus one will be the following. So if I plug in for n zero, that means I am here, then the result will be psi q of minus one. Yeah, n equals zero, zero minus one is minus one. So the same happens for n equals one. So if I plug in n equal to one, I get here psi q of zero. So, and now you see the scheme, how this is made up. So psi q of one will be the value I get for n equals to two. And psi q of minus two will be the value I get for plugging in n equals uh, minus one. So what, what has happened here for L equals to one, right? So this here, is nothing else than the convolution of psi q with e1, yeah, for l equals to one, so e1. What happens here is it's basically the same sequence, but it's shifted a little bit to the right. Yeah, what, what was originally at position n equals zero is now at position n equals one. And this holds true for all the indices. So it's also true what was originally at position n equals one. So the value psi q of one is now at position two. It also holds on the other side. So psi q of minus one, originally, of course, what was at position minus one is now at position zero. So I have a shift to the right. And you can already guess what happens if I set L to two. Then I will not shift once, but I will shift twice to the right. So in the end, what we see here is it is a shift by L to the right. I take my sequence and I shift it to the right L times. Yeah, if L is a positive number, this means I shift to the 
to the right. If it's a negative number, then shifting by a negative number to the right means actually shifting to the left. Yeah? This is a very special property of this, of this nice and simple sequence EL. So now let us look at this example here. It looks rather complicated, but now that we have looked at it from this abstract viewpoint, should be straightforward. So I take n and z, and I'm now wondering what is e42 convoluted with psi of i over 42 at position n. Yeah. I already know it means I need to shift to the right 42 times. So it is the original sequence i 40, uh, over 42, psi of i over 42 at position n minus 42. Okay. So far for the first example. Now let us look at a little bit more complicated example. So now we want to calculate the convolution of psi q with itself. So as before, this means we want to determine a sequence and the sequence is first denoted by psi q convolution with psi q. And as this is a sequence, I need to know its value for each value n in z. So once again, I plug in the definition here. So k, take k out of z. And then psi q of k. Yeah, so I in the first the first summoned just uses the k of my uh, index set. And the second one looks very similar, so it is psi q, but now I use first the n. Oh, wrong color. Let me use blue here. n minus k. So the sum k plus n minus k is n again. So this is n here. Perfect. So this is just the definition. Once again, we have not done math. We done, uh, did not do, we do, did not calculate something, but this is plugging in the definition and this is a, the first step. So as a second step, remember what we did in the previous case. So we wondered when this sequence, let's let us first look at the first sequence. We are wondering when this sequence is zero and when it won't be zero. So this will help us to thin out the set of indices that we are summing about. So psi k, let us look at the definition. So this is zero if k is not in the natural numbers, including zero. This means if k is negative, then I will always have a zero here for psi q. So what I can do is now I can change the set of summation by starting with, um, ah, let us do it in two steps. So the first step would be, I take just k out of n zero, and then I use psi q of k times psi q of n minus k. So if k is in n zero, I also know how to write it. It's just q to the k. Let us do the simplification as well. So now let us shift our focus of attention to the indices that I plug into the second factor. It's n minus k. So it works the same. So n minus k needs to be greater than zero for psi q of n minus k to be something different from zero. But n minus k being greater or equal than zero is just the same as saying that n needs to be larger or equal than k. Or better said, k needs to be smaller or equal than n, and n is a fixed number. So 
what I can do now is I can also now bound the set of indices that I sum about um, from above. So I already have a bound from below, which is zero. Yeah, but this set does not have an upper bound. There are infinitely, infinitely many natural numbers. Now the second condition tells me these numbers all have to be smaller or equal than n. All right, and then I have psi, uh, q to the k as before, and I also plug in the definition of psi q of n minus k. Now that I know that n minus k is larger or equal than zero, I write here q to the um, n minus k here. All right, so what's the result here? So I can now just multiply these two together and I get the sum from k equals zero to n of q to the k plus n minus q, q so q to the n. So, and as this is a constant, it does not depend on k. This is just n plus one times q to the n. So now I have been a little bit sloppy at this part here, because actually we also need another condition here on n. Because if n is negative, then n minus k uh, will always be negative for an n coming from n0. So this actually only holds for n being greater or equal than 0. So what about psi q convolution with psi q for an n that is less than zero? Well, then this guy here will always be zero, no matter what k is. So I get out zero for n being smaller than zero. And that's it. So another way to write down the sequence would be psi q convoluted with psi q of n equals n plus 1 q to the n for n greater or equal than 0 and 0 else. And now you can do the same as before. You can now plug in 1 half e to the pi i or q, and then you get your result here. Yeah, but uh, I wanted you to see that it does not really have anything to do with the numbers we plug in here. We can do it more generally. All right, so this was a little example, and in the homework, uh, you are going to work a, li a little bit closer with the formula itself and derive some, or actually two of the statements about this convolution on the space L1 of Z that you also know from the lecture. So let us jump to the second exercise that we want to talk about today, which focuses more on the um, computer point of view on uh, the problem of convolution. Because on a computer, we are not able to handle sequences that come from L1 of Z. They are just too large. They are, have infinitely many elements. So we cannot represent them as vectors in the memory of our computer. So what we need is a finite version of this convolution. And in exercise 5.3, we want to look at different ways to define something like this on a computer. In the end, what we want to have is something that relates closely with respect to the properties that we already have for the convolution on L1 of Z for our sequences, for our finite sequences here. So, how is the setting? Let us go again through the problem description. So, now assume we have a set, a subset M of Z. Yeah, and then of course we can define also the little space little l1 
of Z, which are just sequences that are indexed over the elements of M. So, and we can also define a norm on this space. So this is a nice vector space. But if you recall the formula that we had here um, before for the convolution, um, it does not work because we need to sum over all indices that are in Z. How do we do this? We, we extend our sequence by zeros with zero padding. Meaning that if we have a sequence in L1 of M, where M is just a subset of Z, I say, well, then I define a new sequence X to the zero, which is in L1 of Z, which is just zero for all indices that are not an element uh, of M. But this way, we have defined a new operation on, well, spaces of finite sequences that actually recycles the definition that we already know. Namely, we extend our sequences by zero to sequences that live on the whole in the index space Z. And then we just calculate the convolution as we uh, did in the exercise before. Let us look at the first example to see how this definition works. So we take um, for M1, we take the index set 0, 1, 2. And our sequence X uh, only has three elements. So it looks like this. So we have X of 0, X of 1, and X of 2. So this is our sequence as an element of L. Uh, L1 of 0, 1, 2. Now the zero padding comes into play and tells me, well, I just extend this guy by zeros all the way to the right and all the way to the left. Now I have an, so it does not finish here, it goes on infinitely long. And this gives me a new element, which is from L1 of Z, yeah? Of course, if I have a finite vector, I extend it by zero to the right and to the left, I get an infinite vector, which is an element of L1 of Z. Now I can calculate the convolution because now this element X is just, can be interpreted as a two-sided infinite sequence. And I calculate the convolution with another infinite sequence, which is Y. So let us just do this as before. So I need to know what is the convolution of X with Y at position N. So by the de definition, this is the convolution of the zero padded version of X with Y at position N. And now, just as in the exercise before, I plug in the whole definition. So I sum over all K in Z and then I use x0 of k times y of n minus k. So once again, we only have used the definition. And now we need to plug in some more knowledge about the index set m that we had before. Because x0 is a very simple sequence. It just lives on this finite set 0, 1, 2. This means x0 of k will only be different from 0 if k equals 0, 1, or 2. I can plug this in, in the sum. So k just goes from 0 to 2. And then the value will just be x of k. And y n of k will be general. I do not know anything about y. y is just a general sequence here. But this is now a sum that only consists of three summons. I can write it out. So. For k equals 0, I get x0 times y of n minus 0, which is y of n. So for k equals 1, this is x1 y of n minus k. For k equals 1 is n minus 1. And the third one is x2 
times y of n minus 2. I can do even more because I know how the sequence is built up. It's built up of 1 third times 1, 1, 1. So 1 third, 1 third, 1 third. And here I have 1 third, here I have 1 third, and have here 1 third. So I can also write this down as a simple mean value. So 1 third of yn plus yn minus 1 plus yn minus 2. So this is just a mean value filter yeah, that, we, that we know from the lecture. Yeah, so x is just a mask that you would use for a mean. Yeah, and here we see we take the mean of yn, yn minus 2, and yn uh, minus 1. Let's do another example, and we really need to take a close look to see how 1 differs from 2 here, and it only differs in the index set m1. Yeah, so the, the sequence that we considered before is the same, but now the index set has shifted a little bit. Why am I doing this? If you recall from Octave and MATLAB, the vectors that we use, the indices always start with 1. So we want to use convolution on a computer. And now we need to know how this way of defining convolution works when we use it on a computer that uses a one-based indexing as Octave or MATLAB do. So let us look at the second example. So we have the same you can have the same image in your head, but now x has been shifted. And we have x1, x2, and x3. We extend it by 0. So in this case, we have, once again, um, the convolution here. But now with a different x, it has a different index set. And I think it's easier if I just copy what we wrote down here and make the corresponding changes. So we go. We are going through this line by line. So in this part here, nothing has happened. This is just definition. In the second line, we used our information about the index set M1. So M1, in our case, is 1, 2, 3. This means I need to change my summation here to go from 1 to 3 instead of from 0 to 2 as before. And now I plugged in the concrete values of k here. So I have here k1, k equals to 2, and k equals to 3. And I also need to change it here, because if k equals 1, then I have here n minus 1. Here I have n minus 2. And here I have n minus 3. And of course, then also the last formula changes a bit. Let me save some time and just write it like this. Now, this is because the sequence x with respect to the values it attains is the same, but it has been shifted. And we also see this shift in, then in our, um, in our outcome. Yeah, so it looks the same, but it has been shifted. So what, what before was the value at, um, at n is now the value at n minus 1. Yeah, if you compare just, just the results, here, so the last lines, if you compare this line with the line here, it was both for x convoluted with y at position n. And even though the expression looks the same, uh, the indices that we use are different. And so now we are coming nearer to the actual problem that we are experiencing here. So now let us look at the following example, namely two finite sequences with the same index set. So this is this is just the setting 
that we also would have on a computer. So we have two sequences and we want to um, calculate the convolution of these two sequences. In the way as before, so we extend our sequences by zero. So this is what has happened in this table also, extended to zero to the right and also to the left. So now if I calculate the convolution, I have also given you here some, some help by writing down y0 minus l, y1 minus l, y2 minus l. So how does this help us? Let us once again calculate the convolution of x and y. And now we are going not to calculate it for each n, but only for, um, for k's from 0 to 5. Yeah, so I'm going to calculate the convolution of x and y for 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. So I'm not going to, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to write down the definition once again. So, because it's uh, nowhere else here visible. Um, so we have here the convolution of x and y and y zero minus k. So why am I writing it down like this? So normally here, I have an n and now n or k in this case is zero. So I also write down the zero here. And now let us look at the sum. How is it calculated? Well, it's x at position zero times y at position zero. Then k goes to one and it's x one times y at minus one. So for plugging in l minus one here, I just see, I basically, in order to calculate this, I need to take the product of um, the first line with the second line. And I see this product evaluates to zero. Yeah, because actually those two sequences do not have an overlap. So we have a zero here. So the same is for x convoluted with y at position one. In this case, I'm going to look at the second line here. Yeah, and then I have y, of, uh, y to the zero of one minus k. And I see once again, so this pairing is always disjoint. So I'm always multiplying something that is zero with something that is maybe not zero. So the outcome here as well is zero. So you will see now it gets more interesting it, if we are at um, n equals two. So we are now in this line here. Now we have one element that meets an element which is different from zero. So I can write down the result here and it is x1 times y2. And we can do this also for, for maybe it's uh, as, a, as a last one for x convoluted with y at position three. So then I will have y3 of l and then I will have y1 here, y2 here. And actually I do not care about the rest. I can see here, so y1 will be multiplied with x2 and x1 will be multiplied with y2. So x1 times y2 plus x2 times y1. I think I made a little mistake here. So it's, this should be actually the product of x1 and y1. And you can see here once again, so I did this little check that I just told you works for this formula here, it also works in the results. So the sum always needs to evaluate to the point where I evaluate the co convolution. So here I'm evaluating the convolution at three. So the indices that I sum up need to sum up to three. So and you can do the same for X convoluted with four. In this case, you will get um, Y3 times X1 plus Y2 times X2 times y, uh, y1 times x3. So this could be something that we now implement at the computer, but it's a little bit odd. Why is that? Um, this is explained here in the first sentence in part four. 
So for index sets that start with one, like the ones that we have on a computer, the result that we get is actually a sequence that, well, it also starts, of course, at one or at zero, however I choose it, but the value at zero will always be zero. Yeah, so there is an unnatural shift in the resulting sequence that we get out. And it would be nicer if we had two sequences that start with one, if their convolution also would start at one. So we somehow need to find a formula that shifts, that does the following shift. So I want to have a new convolution such that, so I'm using another symbol for this, like a star, that this will be the result at position one. Yeah, so I convolute two things that have indices starting at one. I want the convolution to be something that also starts at index one. And then this should be x star y at position two and not at position three. And one way to do this, and this is actually the way that it is done also in Octave or MATLAB, is using the formula 5.32 below here. And we can check that this formula actually does what it, well, what I promised you it, it would do. Um, and the shift is incorporated here in the second part. Let us take a look. So I calculate the convolution Let's, let's maybe do this example here. So I calculate the convolution x star y at position one. And now I copy this new formula. This is also a new symbol, new formula. The sum starts at one, it goes to infinity, x zero of k. So this is, this is the same as in the formula before. And now comes the change. Let me mark it with red, y zero of um, maybe I only highlight the part that is really important here. So y0 of and now n minus k plus 1. So let us calculate the sum. So for n equals 1, I need this here to be greater or equal than zero. Yeah, so if n equals one, I can write down a one here. And I also write it down here. And I get the formula that two needs to be greater or equal um, than k. So the sum I did not do, make a mistake here. Um, yeah, so it should go from k equals one to two. Uh, so let me check if this goes the way it was intended to go. X zero of k y zero of two minus k. So if I plug in the case here, I have x of one times y of one. Yeah? So this is the case if k equals one. So the second case is x of two times y zero of zero, which is zero. So I get out x1 of y1, which is exactly what, and now I'm really relieved that it that it worked out. So it exactly what we wanted it to be. So a convolution that respects this shift in a way that now I have two sequences that start at one, and their convolution at at, at one is what we would it want to be if we used the regular convolution and on L1 of Z yeah, without the shift. Okay, and this works of course also for all N. So the formula that we have here is a very nice uh, formula that you could also use in order to implement a convolution 
on uh, in MATLAB, for example, or in Octave. So I brought you a little example here. So if we have a formula, we have x as before, so one third times uh, one one one, yeah, something like this, and we take uh, y our sequence one two three maybe. Then we can use the operation conf of x and y, and we get out um, the following. Yeah, so a nice result that also starts again at index one and at index one the result is one third how does this come up well i multiply one third with one and i get this result here yeah all right so this is actually the way that is uh, implemented in matlab and you can also if you check the documentation you will also find this formula here so you have maybe now for the last part you have made, I think, maybe from the um, from the quick example I gave you here, you have seen that the convolution of two vectors may be larger than the original vectors that I plug in. Something that cannot happen if I have two vectors that live on L1 of Z. The result will once again be in L1 of Z. But now I have two vectors of length 3. And the outcome, if I calculate everything that does not yield zero always, has length five. So how, how does this work? So I have one vector that goes from one to the element L1. And then, let me move this a little bit. I have a new vector y, so this is x. And I have a new vector y. That has length um, L2, and I have already mirrored it the way I can use it for uh, convolution. And now what happens is if I calculate the convolution as before, I first start at the, oh, so the first element of my convolution that will be different from zero is the one I get for this shift here. Yeah. So and then I shift this y along until I reach this point here. And this is the point that I want you to focus on now. So now the last element of y meets, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the last element of y meets the last element of L1. Yeah. So this means I start with a vector x that has length L1. I take the convolution with another vector that has length L2 and the resulting vector has the length L1 plus L2, but I do not want to calculate this red, to count this red box twice. So the length is L1 plus L2 minus one. And this is the answer for the set M3 that we want to use here. So if I, calculate the convolution um, of L1 of uh, a set that goes from, let's say, 1 to L1 with a set that goes from 1 to L2, then the resulting sequence will be an element of L1 from 1 to L1 plus L2 minus 1. If I get rid of all the zeros that I would get if I uh, if I move this mask that I see here one index more, yeah, then I will always just zeros will meet up here. All right, so that's it from me for today. Mm -hmm.